I'd like to ask you a question. If I were to tell you that Jesus Christ is soon coming at the rapture, how would that make you feel as a believer? Would that excite you? Would that get your hopes up because of this world, the way it's going? I have no doubt that if you believe Jesus was coming very soon, and I believe he is, if you believe that, that is going to lift your spirits. But if I were to tell you that Jesus is not coming anytime soon, a matter of fact, Jesus can't come until after the Great Tribulation. And that would include the three and a half years prior to that, known as Daniel's 70th week. How would that make you feel if the seven years that lie ahead, that the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation and throughout a lot of the Old Testament scriptures, if you were to be told that you were going to go through that time, and a time that Jesus said is going to be so bad that there's going to be tribulation like never was before, and never shall be. It's going to be an awful time, a time where there's going to be wars and famines and pestilences. Families are going to turn one against another and family members against family members. It's going to be hell on earth. It's going to be an awful time. The Antichrist is going to seize control of this world, and he's going to set as king of this world. And he's going to demand you either receive a mark in your forehead or in your right hand, or you won't be able to buy or sell. If I were to tell you that you are headed for that time and you have to go through that, and chances are you'll be martyred or you'll starve to death or you'll suffer some catastrophe in your life that will bring death and destruction upon you. If I were to tell you that, how would that make you feel? Would that trouble you in your spirit? I have no doubt anyone with any common sense, if someone were to tell you that and you were to believe it, it would definitely cause you much grief to think that you're going to go through such a time. What I want to do today is just show the fallacy of those that believe in a post-tribulation rapture. And I want you to realize, too, first and foremost, the Apostle Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He's not the apostle to the circumcision. That was Peter. And the church was a mystery. Read the book of Ephesians, and you'll come to an understanding that Paul had many mysteries revealed to him. And one of the mysteries was the mystery of the church, the bride of Christ. And once you start getting a handle on that, you'll understand the Bible a whole lot better than you do now if you do not differentiate between the church and Israel. Looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, this is one of the key passages about the rapture. And I want to say this too, the rapture, that word's not found in the Bible, and we've heard that ad nauseum from Bible teachers that it's not in there. And the fact of the matter is, what we call the rapture is the resurrection. Now, I'm not going to take time in this video. I did in another video in the past that gets into different resurrections. Jesus Christ was the first fruits of those that rose from the dead. And after he resurrected, there, there was saints that came out of the graves in Jerusalem and were seen in Jerusalem. And they were resurrected. They did not die after that. They were resurrected because Christ was the first fruits. And after his resurrection, all those that resurrect from then on will never die again. And you can read a resurrection in the book of Revelation, chapter number 11, with the two witnesses and how they're killed. And three and a half days later, they resurrect. And a voice comes from heaven that says, come up hither. And they're taken up. In a rapture, a.k.a. resurrection. It's their resurrection. Now, the Apostle Paul, who had this mystery revealed to him about the rapture, the resurrection, this is what he said in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and verse 13. I'm going to read to the end of the chapter here. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 
For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we, now notice Paul says we, he includes himself in this, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This section of scripture is meant to be a comfort. And may I say, brethren, that the comfort is knowing that Jesus Christ is coming for his bride very soon. Now, I believe the Apostle Paul believed that he could be one that was alive there in verse 15, where he said that we, which are alive and remain. I believe Paul understood that the Feast of Trumpets is going to be when the resurrection takes place, a.k.a. the rapture. And I believe that's why Paul put himself in there. He knew some year, some Feast of Trumpets, the resurrection, the rapture would take place. And he said, comfort one another with these words. Now, that's a comfort. And what would be the opposite of a, of a comfort? Be something that caused you turmoil. Now, look at this in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And I'm going to read the first three verses. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. That is the rapture. That is exactly what Paul was speaking of back in the scripture I just read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're gathered up into the air. That's A-E-R in the Greek, and it means the lower, denser atmosphere of the earth. We're taken up into the clouds, in the air, to meet him and the resurrected saints. Our bodies will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump. And that is the Feast of Trumpets. Notice it says that you be not soon shaken in mind. That would be the opposite of comforted. Or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, Paul makes it clear that he did not want these people to be shaken in mind, to be troubled. That word troubled, it means to cry aloud, make a noise by outcry to trouble, frighten, to be troubled in mind, to be frightened or alarmed. You know, there is a lot of Christians that are buying into this post-tribulation teaching, and they are troubled by it. They are stocking up food, which I, I wouldn't say it's a bad thing now with the way prices are getting on stuff, and there's going to be food shortages. And if Jesus does not come at this Feast of Trumpets and it's next year, well, there's probably going to be some hunger and it's not going to be good, but God is not going to allow us to enter in to the time that he calls Daniel's 70th week or Jacob's trouble. So if you are listening to people that are preaching a post-trib rapture, you will be shaken in your mind. You will be troubled. Notice he says, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. So somebody must have wrote a letter telling them, that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, if that would be the rapture, like Ken Hovind teaches, oh, that the day of Christ is the rapture. Well, that would not trouble a Christian unless you're not right with God. It would be a comfort to know that he is coming. But this, this right here is someone told them that, hey, we're going into the tribulation. They're saying the same exact thing that Ken Hovind is saying, and Stephen Anderson and many of his ilk are saying that we are going to go through this most awful time. And they were troubled by this. It bothered them, and rightfully so. I don't want to have to go through seven years of terrible times on this earth. I don't want to have to go through the last three and a half years of that where it's going to be worse than any time that ever was before. And see, the very thing that Paul's warning about here is the very thing Ken Hovind is guilty of and others like him. Notice verse 3, let no man, that's Ken Hovind, Stephen Anderson, and on and on and on, those that preach a post-trib rapture, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come 
except there come a falling away first. And notice falling away first doesn't say a falling away of the faith. It's the word apostasia, which means a departure. And the departure is what we were talking about back in verse 1, the gathering together unto him. That is where we're changed in a moment. The twin of and I were gathered up to meet Christ in the air and all the resurrected saints that make up the bride of Christ. And that's the falling away. It's not a falling away of the faith. Yes, it does say in the Bible about a falling away of the faith in the end times, but it's this is talking about the rapture. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So this awful time that's coming cannot happen. The day of Christ cannot happen until these things happen. The rapture and the man of sins revealed. Notice, it also calls him the son of perdition. But there's a dividing line. This makes up the seven-year period known as Daniel's 70th week, the man of sin. He's the one that rises right after the rapture takes place. He's going to be here for three and a half years. He's going to suffer a wound in his head, and he's going to have a resurrection. And then he's going to go into the temple and desecrate the temple like is spoken of here, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, that's the son of perdition, or that is worship, so that he as God setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So this will then be the last three and a half years, that time that Jesus said is so horrible, there was never a time like it before and never will be again. A terrible time. So people that teach a post-trib rapture are troubling and shaking the minds of Christians. They're having a bad effect. They're not bringing comfort. And people that, that want to criticize and say, oh, you, you pre-tribbers are just for escapism. Well, that's exactly what Jesus said. He's going to deliver us from this present evil world. It's going to happen. But we are not going through this time. And shame on the people that are teaching this stuff, that are troubling the saints of God. And Paul warned it. That's exactly what that means. If this verse, if this section here, that the day of Christ, if that means the rapture, why would that ever bother anybody? Why would that affect someone's mind and that they would be troubled? And then looking on 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 4, there's many times that Ken Hoven has said that tribulation is what the world does to us and wrath is what God does to the world. Well, let's just look here for a minute and see what God says. Look in verse 4, So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. So we are, as Christians, going to suffer persecution. We're going to have tribulation in this world, and that's just part of being a Christian. Notice, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Notice it doesn't say he's going to recompense wrath, even though, yes, he's going to. But he says here, God is going to recompense tribulation. Now, Ken Hovind loves to say that tribulation is what the world does to us. And wrath is what God does to the world. Well, here it says God recompenses tribulation to them that trouble you. And notice he says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. We're going to be resting with Jesus Christ for seven years up in heaven before he comes with his mighty angels and destroys the the people at Armageddon, the, the armies at Armageddon, he takes back this world and the kingdoms become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So tribulation, God recompenses that to those that trouble you. Now, again, a huge error that people that teach a post-trib rapture is that the church goes through this time. And I want you to notice who is listed, or who God says is going to go through this time. Notice this is Daniel chapter 9, verse number 24. 
Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Now, who is this being revealed to? Well, this is Daniel, Daniel the prophet. Upon thy people, that's the Jewish people, that's Israel, the nation Israel, and upon thy holy city. Well, what's the holy city? That's Jerusalem. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring an everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So 70 weeks are determined. We know 69 of those weeks have been completed, and there's yet a week of seven years, one week left. Notice here, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. There's the seven-year time period. The man of sin is going to confirm a covenant with many, many. I don't know if this this peace treaty that, that uh, President Trump came up with, if that's the covenant's going to be confirmed, whatever it is, and it's a good chance it, it is, but it's going to be with many, and it's going to be for seven years. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And the, for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. We understand this is the sign that is the middle of the seven-year time period known as Daniel's 70th week. And this begins then the great tribulation that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24. But this is for Israel, thy people, Daniel's people, and Jerusalem, thy holy city. It's not for the church. You can't find any instructions given to the church as they enter into this time. But Matthew 24, he gives specific instructions to those that are in Judea. He gives instructions for those people to pray that their flight be not on the Sabbath day. And if they're on their housetops, to, to flee to the mountains. Don't go back into your house. We don't live on our housetops here. But in Israel, the housetops are flat. So understand that this is dealing with Israel and Jerusalem. The book of Jeremiah uses the term Jacob's trouble. This is Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse number 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. All of Israel is going to be saved. He, Israel. Jacob, God changed his name to Israel. So it's Jacob's trouble. Again, the error that comes by not distinguishing between the church and Israel. Daniel chapter number 12, <clears throat> notice verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, <clears throat> the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people, thy people, again, this is Israel, shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. <clears throat> this is the midpoint of the tribulation. This is what Jesus talked about, that time of trouble. That there's none like it. None like it. It's pretty easy to see when you start looking at Scripture. That's why anytime I teach the Bible, I love to have the Scripture in front of you to see what the Bible says. And I could have my face on here, but I don't think you'd want to see that. I think you'd rather see the Bible. The Bible is what gives us faith, it gives us understanding. And it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead, of those that died during the tribulation period. Revelation chapter 20, I believe it's verse 4. Not 100% on that, but I think that's it, where it talks about those that were martyred for Christ. They're going to be resurrected, and they're going to rule and reign with Christ on the earth. So there's many resurrections through the Bible. There were those that resurrected after Christ resurrected. There's going to be the church that resurrect at the rapture when Christ comes to take his bride out of this world to start Daniel's 70th week, that the church has no part in it. And then those that die during that time, they'll be raised up. Those that died for Christ, 
raised up and rule with him on the earth here. Notice the end of this. Chapter 12 says, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, there's a verse, and we'll look at it in just a second here, back in earlier in the book of Daniel that says about there's 2,300 days until the temple's cleansed. And I know Ken Hovind loves those days because he then makes up a, a chart that fits his post-trib teaching. But here we see there's 1,290 days. Now, every, every time in the book of Revelation where it says about 1,290, 60 days, we know that's three and a half years with the Jewish calendar. It's also said a time, times, and half a time, three and a half years, or 42 months, three and a half years. Now, this this is a sticking point here, and you can debate this. And This 90 days, there's 30 days more than the 1260. So what are those extra 30 days here for? Well, is it for Christ to to build the the temple in Jerusalem. I would not say dogmatically what it is, but obviously there's 30 days on to the 1260, but it's not 2,300. You'll notice that. you also notice here, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the, cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. So here's even more days added on. Now, where are they coming from? That's an extra 45 days. So where did they come from? Why is that necessary? Well, I would guess and say that that has to do with the gathering of the nations because Jesus is going to sit on, the, on his throne. You can read it in Matthew chapter number 25. And the Sheep and goats are going to be gathered before him, and he's going to judge the nations. So I would say that these extra days would come to the end of that judgment. That would be the 1,305 and 30 days when that judgment is over. Because Jesus said, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to that time. So the ones that are the sheep that he puts on the right hand that enter into the kingdom... Those will be the ones that are blessed here in verse 12. And if you believe something different, you know, let me know what you think. I'm not saying dogmatically that's what it is, but it seems to me by studying Scripture, that makes best sense of these extra days. But you'll notice it's not 2,300 days. Let's go back where it does say that. Here in Daniel chapter number 8, this is speaking about the little horn known as Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV. And you could read here about the daily sacrifice. I'll just go ahead and read. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? How long would it be? And he said unto me, On to two thousand and three hundred days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now this has already taken place. Ken Hoven wants to put this at the end. We just read in Daniel chapter 12 how many days. It's not two thousand and three hundred days after the abomination of desolation. It's twelve hundred and sixty days to the end of, and 1,290 days to, to where the things are according to Daniel chapter 12. So anyway, 2,300 days. How does that fit in? Well, if you've ever read the book of Maccabees, you will find out, and historians claim, that it comes down to exactly that number of days till the Maccabees cleanse the temple. Now, I just have 
a little clip here I'd like to read. Now this I've got off the internet about Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV. The time period covered 2,300 days figures to be about six and a third years. We believe this prophecy was fulfilled before the birth of Christ during the reign of the Seleucid king Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. Antiochus desecrated the temple in Jerusalem and severely persecuted the Jews from about September 171 B.C. to December 165 B.C., exactly 2,300 days. When Antiochus dies, died, the Jews purified and rededicated the temple, just as Daniel had predicted. These events are commemorated in the celebration of Hanukkah. The detailed prophecies contained in God's Word are part of what makes the Bible unique among religious texts. Our God can make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. And he has revealed significant events in the future, counting out the very days of those periods of time. So when Ken Hoven or anyone else wants to throw in these 2,300 days, just remind them that this has already occurred. And what hasn't occurred yet is what Daniel had revealed to him at the end about the 1,290 days and the 1,305 and 30 days. And that is from the time of the abomination of desolation. So that's just another way of looking at why post-tribulationalism is wrong. It troubles people. It causes them in their mind to be shaken. And it's sad that this is taking place today in the churches, many churches, are taking a hold of this doctrine. And I believe the reason it's taking hold is because, as the Bible says, that there's going to be seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And many are going to be led away into error because they do not read the Bible. They don't have a good pastor. They don't have good Bible teachers to lead them in the truth. And many young Christians are buying into this false teaching of post-trib and it's, it's really sad. I believe it's hurtful to the body of Christ. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Jesus Christ is coming before the tribulation comes. He's going to deliver us from this present evil world. And we look forward to the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Even so, come Lord Jesus.